Pre-atomic steel. What is that? And why did our director post about it being such a big deal? My name is Elijah Otto, curator of the USS Kidd Veterans Museum. Today we're going to talk about it. Steel is a process which combines iron and carbon together, which when you combine two metals in chemistry, it's called an alloy. So steel production between the mid-1850s all the way through the mid-20th century is going to be done via what's called the Bessemer process. In really simplistic terms, the Bessemer process introduces air from the outside into the steel making process. This air is atmospheric, which means it's the air that's all around us. Prior to 1945, this air is actually not radiated or has very, very, very little radiation. July 1945, with the detonation of the first atomic bomb, this air is now what we call radiated. So that leads us into our next question about what's the difference between pre-atomic or low background steel, which denotes that it has low radiation, versus post-atomic steel. So as I talked about with the Bessemer process, drawing in atmospheric air, the, between 1945 and through the 1950s, several nations around the world detonated atmospheric atomic tests. So it means they exploded the atomic bomb in the atmosphere, compared to doing underground testing or underwater testing, like in the Bikini Atoll in the, in the 1950s. So this radiates the atmosphere, um, and then the manufacturers of the steel are pulling in that radiated air and putting it into their steel that way. So when the steel gets produced, normally this wouldn't be such a big deal. But with construction, the building of bridges, uh, anything like that that would require steel, you don't really care about that too much. It's when you go into the sensitive measuring equipments or Geiger counters, which a Geiger counter is what's used to detect radiation. When you get radiated steel, it throws off these measurements. Um, another example is the instruments that are on the space shuttle. Those get radiated when they're up in space. So you have to make sure you have low background steel for this to make sure that their measurements are still correct. Another example of this is medical equipment. Uh, medical equipment, if you have a radiated piece of steel, it's going to throw off that measurement. In the medical field, you want to be pretty precise with what you're measuring. Those are the major differences between low background steel and high background steel or radiated steel. So how do we get this low background steel or this uh, pre-atomic steel? So we can't go around just making it, obviously, with the Bessemer process and the atmospheric uh, radiation that's happened. So our next sourcing is going to be through World War II ships. A lot of these ships were made prior to World War II, made mostly out of steel. So that's where we're going to start salvaging these wrecks. Uh, I'm going to give some notable examples of this and break them down. Uh, the first notable example is the HMS Repulse, which I mentioned in my task force video, which you can check out. Uh, it was sunk by the Japanese on December 10th, 1941 and its wreck was found in 1959. Through a long process, the British Ministry of Defense created the, a War Graves Protection Act, if you will, uh, and in 2002 designated the Repulse as a protected site uh, or protected place. When they went back to uh, resurvey the wreck in 2002, they found out that the ship was already starting to get salvaged uh, by Indonesian and Chinese vessels. Um, and so they labeled it as a protected place and they started putting in measures to help prevent that from happening um, and designated it also as a war grave. A lot of these ships are going to be under this protection. Uh, some of them were a little bit too late in this protection. Uh, the worst examples are going to be of the Dutch Navy uh, that fought in the Battle of Java Sea with the Java, the Rudder, and their destroyer, the Conteneur. These ships were found in 2002. Uh, and after some surveying and mapping, the Dutch government uh, placed them under a Protections Act similar to the British one. And then when it went back in 2016 to do a resurvey of this, they realized that all three of these ships are gone. The only thing that's left of these ships are the imprints in which they made into the seafloor. So what happened was in 2017, after various reportings, uh, the Dutch Ministry of Defense filed a report stating that these ships were illegally salvaged, uh, almost completely to the last piece of spare metal. 
Um, and local sources off the island of Java stated that they took these bodies that were in the ships of these war graves and just threw them into a mass grave on land, which is pretty sad to think about. And lastly, another example of this is going to be the German High Seas Fleet, which was scuttled at the end of the First World War in 1919. The German Navy uh, did not want their ships to fall into Allied hands, and so they scuttled them in Scapa Flow, at the very, very top of Great Britain. The British realize, hey, we can still use these ships, so they actually go in and start salvaging these ships and bringing them up uh, for the marketplace for secondary equipment use, so medical technologies and sensitive measuring equipment uh, were used out of this German Navy, uh, German Navy ships. So that leads us to today. Do we have to worry about radiated steel? What are we doing about this problem? And that answer is twofold. Uh, number one, in 1963, the partial nuclear weapons ban comes into effect, which bans atmospheric detonation of atomic weapons uh, for testing. So that reduces the radiation of the atmosphere and limits to underground testing. The second part of that is a new steel making process called the basic oxygen steel making process, which basically takes pure oxygen and puts it through a sort of lance, if you will, and shoves it directly into the molten iron and then creates steel that way. So this way we're not using atmospheric air or radiated air, we're using 99% pure oxygen. So where does that lead us again to today? So after 1963 and the banning of the atomic uh, atmospheric testing, several studies are conducted and realized that the basic effective dose of radiation that's in the air is 0.11 uh, MSV per year. And since then, as recent as 2010, studies have shown that this uh, effective dose has gone down to 0 0.005 MSV per year. So what that means is that we're now approaching the pre-atomic uh, levels of background radiation. So the salvaging of these ships, and we're talking about background steel and what it's needed for, um, is actually almost irrelevant at this point. Uh, so this is a problem that's pretty much solved itself. So why am I talking about low background steel in the USS Kidd? What do they have to do with each other? The main reason is that the USS Kidd was built between late 42 to early 43, and she was using pre-atomic steel. So uh, right outside this Mississippi uh, River, we have a nice chunk of history and literally a big chunk of pre-atomic steel. Uh, while she's in dry dock, she, her paint is getting stripped, and she's getting stripped all the way down to the bare steel uh, being exposed, and all those guys that are working on her realize that they're working on pre-atomic steel. And if y'all want to see the pre-atomic seal being worked on, check out this playlist uh, about the dry dock video updates, and you can take a look and see what the ship is up to while she's in dry dock getting repaired. Thank y'all for watching.